It is well with my soul. Mm. Thank you, Wade. Thanks, Bob. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, speak to us today. Open our hearts and our minds that we might hear anew from you. And please, God, cross out the eye. Amen. Now, if you're able, would you stand and let's read together God's word for today, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It's on page 927 in your pew Bible. Let's read together God's holy word. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, this text is powerful. And I know that God has a word for us today. I also know that I sit under this text as I too come with fear and trembling. I desire that your faith might rest on God's power and not on my words. There's a master class in this text for preachers to be sure. Well, we've been on a Lenten journey together. I don't know how it's gone for you, but for me, it's been a Lent full of learning, full of challenge and personal growth. God has spoken to me through frustration, through tears, through moments of letting go, through countless reminders that my hope rests in him alone. Lent has also been outside for me as I have spent hours already in the bleachers of Little League games. It's been a joy to talk to other parents as we cheer on our sons and God conversations have come up along the way. I've carried this cross in my pocket the entire Lent. I know some of you has, have as well. My cross has lost a little bit of its shine, um, but that's okay. It's still with me. And I think I'm going to carry it with me now, even after Easter. I want to weave today some personal experience in with our text. And also I want to look at Palm Sunday as we mark Jesus' entry into Jerusalem to begin Holy Week. God has spoken to me during Lent through three C words, and I really didn't plan it this way, but it happened. Confirmation, the cross, and COVID. I didn't mean for all these words to be C words, but they are. Let's begin on Ash Wednesday. As you may know, in early February, I switched roles from director of family ministries to the executive director of operations. Well, all fall, I had been planning to co-facilitate our confirmation class for our high school students. And I was excited to see that through. And so I retained and kept doing that confirmation class, even though my new job has different demands. Confirmation was to start the Sunday following Ash Wednesday. And have I mentioned that I have a high school student in my house? One who was baptized right here as an infant, and one for whom we had hoped a confirmation class would be available. Well, I sat next to my teen on Ash Wednesday. He didn't want to be in church. He poked at his brother, finding every way imaginable to show us and those around us his restlessness. Ellen, I owe you an apology. <laughs> My mom's stress rose. 
he had been resisting signing up for confirmation. I don't want to go. I want to do church on my own terms. Ouch. It hurt my heart to watch my son push away. My brain told me that this is developmentally appropriate. He's right where he's supposed to be. My ministry mind reminded me that the point of confirmation is to allow students to take hold of their own faith, to make their own decisions, to claim their baptism. Give them space. But I wasn't ready for it. Not in my own home. It's funny how the developmental process is so easy to watch in someone else's life. <laughs> but oh, so surprising and challenging when it occurs to those we love. I remembered the scripture that my husband Don and I offered as a prayer when we baptized him from Ephesians. It said, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long, how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Well, as we walked forward to receive our ashes, to be reminded that we are but dust, I was wrestling with the Lord. God, I desire that he knows how deep and wide is your love for him. And I am at a loss. Letting go. We left the sanctuary in a hush and a small wooden cross was placed in my hand. I gripped the cross as my son and I drove home in silence. Almost to our house, I told him how we had prayed for him. I told him how dad and I know that a life with Christ is one filled with hope and a promise and how we want that for him too. It's now between you and God. My right hand was on the wheel and as I drove, my left hand squeezed the cross. Jesus, I need you. Okay, I'll go to confirmation, he said. God, please draw him near to you. Draw him to you, I prayed. May his decision be based on following your spirit and not on my words, not on my desire. The following Sunday, he came to confirmation and so did 19 other students. And we have met together each Sunday morning at 8.30 in the morning, the entire Lent. It's been wonderful. I will say daylight savings was painful though. My son is not done wrestling, and he's likely not alone. You can pray for our students, as some of them are wondering whether now is the time to say yes to Jesus. We'll meet many of them next Sunday at the 1130 service as they claim their baptism. Frankly, our students are faced with some of the challenges that Paul found in Corinth. They are, they are surrounded with the ideology of the day. They are becoming used, used to self-reliance. And the cross of Jesus Christ confronts the culture that they find in their schools and among their friends. Let's head to Corinth. We know that the Apostle Paul cares deeply for this church in a city filled with ideology, religion, philosophy, rhetoric, all of which run in contrast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Corinthian church is a young church filled with young believers who need encouragement on how they might live a life reflective of their faith. In Paul's letter, he's discipling this church. And as Pastor George has been leading us through this Lenten sermon series entitled Crosswalk, We've been asked, how does the cross of Jesus Christ impact our life? How do we live? How do we see our life through the lens of the cross? Have we let Paul's words to the Galatians take root in our lives? 
He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In this series, we have looked at our mind, our work, our bodies, our singleness or married life, and our love, all in light of the cross of Christ. And if you haven't heard these sermons by Pastor George and Mike, I encourage you to listen to them. You can find them on our YouTube channel. That would be a great thing to do this week. Paul's message to the Corinthian church has so much application to us, to our times, today. Have you noticed that each of these messages has 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2 underneath it? We read it just a moment ago. It says, for I resolve to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul is exercising a discipline of shedding all knowledge, focusing entirely on Jesus. He's not being lazy or unprepared as a teacher. Rather, Paul is changing the terms of the discourse in Corinth. This is a cosmopolitan city, bustling with business venture, international trade, sophisticated ideas. It showcases the best athletes. It's a proud place which idealized dazzling speech and presentation. One-upmanship was the name of the game. Gordon Fee writes this in his commentary. He says, rather than engaging in rhetoric or philosophy, Paul was bearing witness to God, what God had done in Christ to effect salvation. Paul doesn't glory in his weaknesses for their own sake, nor simply to contrast himself with the sophists. Rather, he does so to remind the Corinthians, as they should well remember, that the real power does not lie in the person or presentation of the preacher, but it is in the work of the Spirit, as is, as is evidenced by their own existence." End quote. I have no doubt that Paul would have been effective in the, in the Corinthian way. He was a pedigreed rabbi, trained by the best, arguably one of the most brilliant minds of his time. Paul was persuasive, persistent, argumentative in all the right ways. But he intentionally laid down his intellectual strength and became a vessel for the Holy Spirit. He himself became a model of one relying solely on the power of God as he joined Jesus on mission. Paul's entire focus was on Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and through this teaching, we too are challenged to take every thought captive to Jesus in all areas of our life. We hear the words of Jesus echoed here from Luke 9, 23, where Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Paul intentionally denies himself and relies on the power of God to speak through him to this church in Corinth. And later he writes in the letter, in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12, he writes about a personal affliction and he says, three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, I am strong. Paul knows his message is countercultural in the Corinthian ear. 
Allowing oneself to be weak so that God's power might not only sustain, but make one strong? Isn't strength built by exercising the mind, the body, asserting one's authority? Isn't strength coming from being one's best possible self? What is Paul doing? In our weakness, he is strong. Friends, the Corinthians are not the only ones for whom this is a challenging message. As I read this, Corinth sounds a lot like Seattle. I grip the cross in my pocket. I bump into God's strength as I've exhausted my limits. When I've run out of me, I can see him holding, carrying, sustaining, providing, but God's power and strength have nothing to do with me. He's a constant. His power is not regulated by my decisions. However, I don't seem to notice him until his provision, I don't seem to notice his provision until I've hit a wall, until I've run out of gas. He's been here all along, waiting, His grace is enough. Friends, instead of exhausting ourselves, let's start, like Paul, with deciding to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. This is the surprise of the cross. Strength found in weakness. Life coming from death. What would life be like if we began in the humble posture of weakness, allowing the grace of Christ to be our lead rather than our own self-sufficiency? Jesus said it too in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. Here's how Eugene Peterson interpreted Jesus' words as written in the message. He wrote, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. And the psalmist knew it and wrote in Psalm 46, 10, cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. Well, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. And years ago, our youngest children stood right here and sang a song, Let the Gates Be Opened Wide, set to a Brahms melody. And I know it because it gets stuck in my head every single year. Uh, Our technology has it such that we're reminded of memories. Do you get that on your phone where it says, 10 years ago, this happened? Well, that song entered my feed this week. And the children sang this question. Who is this king who enters in? Who is this king? Who is the one around whom Paul focuses his entire attention? Let's turn now to Jerusalem. It's time for the Passover festival, and roughly 2.7 million people are in the city to celebrate. Word has spread among the people that there are two men to see, if you can. Rumor has it that Lazarus, who was dead for four days, was raised to life. He's here. And the one who raised him, Jesus, he's also in town. They are in the city. And we read in John 10, John 12, that a crowd built just as much to see Lazarus as it did, who is the living proof of Jesus' authority, as it did to see Jesus, the miracle worker. The Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, felt their entire authority structure challenged 
if Lazarus was indeed up and walking about. Unless they could do something about Lazarus, the foundations of their power were slipping away. And so the chief priest made specific plans to kill Lazarus because so many Jews were believing in Jesus. They feared that the masses were building and would overthrow them. Jesus and Lazarus were both wanted men. We can feel the tension in the air. And in spite of an arrest warrant on Jesus, he enters Jerusalem publicly on a donkey for all who wish to see. I wonder as he rode if he could see the hill on which he would be crucified in just a few short days. I imagine the emotions that Jesus may have felt as he entered the city. A rough week ahead of him. Perhaps he experienced dread, determination, maybe wonder, but I really think it was love that drove him. Love for the disciples, the women and men who walked with him. Love for the people of this great city of Jerusalem. Love for Jew and for Gentile. And love for the future, for generations not yet born. Ultimately, this love and obedience of God the Father fueled Jesus' resolve. In his book, Jesus and the Cross, William Barclay wrote this. He said, there is a courage which is born of the impulse of the moment, a courage born at some sudden emergency in which one has no time to think and in which one becomes a hero by a kind of instinctive reaction. But there is an even higher courage, the courage of one who has had time to think, the courage of one who sees with complete clarity the terrible things which lie ahead and who deliberately goes on. Jesus knew that men would, could, could crucify him, but he also knew that men were powerless to eliminate him from history. He who was on his way to the cross looked forward to the day when all men and women would know his name. End quote. Jesus processed through the cheering crowd. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is from Psalm 119, 118. And they added to the psalm. They said, he is the king of Israel. We know it's likely that the people expected a governmental leader, a victorious warrior. And this likely wasn't the first kingly entrance that they had witnessed. Many were probably there when Herod arrived. Or even Pilate made an entrance into the city. And a Roman entrance is quite spectacular. It would include the golden Roman eagle standard, followed by pennants of Rome, soldiers and chariots. A big deal. Contrast that with Jesus the king. Jesus rode on a donkey. His fanfare was the collective cheer of the crowd the Hosanna. The donkey on which he rode was not an animal that we associate with today. Rather, it was the animal on which kings rode when they came in peace. Jesus came deliberately refusing the war horse and role of warrior Messiah. Rather, he rode on a donkey as prince of peace. Perhaps seeing the words of Zechariah fulfilled caught the attention of some of the faithful. For Zechariah wrote, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. Jesus entered the city a wanted man. He entered the city in a posture of peace. And many would see this as a position of weakness. God's power made perfect in weakness. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a mission which would tear at his soul, but one to which he would stay true. A mission that would test the faith of his followers. A mission that would offer salvation to all who would believe. 
In a few short days after entering the city, Jesus will wash his disciples' feet and share one last meal with them. He will invite them to pray with and for him. And indeed, he will be crowned king, but with a humiliating crown of thorns, thorns pressed into his head. By the end of the week, the Passover celebrants will witness or hear word of his crucifixion. Crucifixion is death in the most shameful way. Jesus, King of the Jews, he will be called. Luke writes that darkness fell over the entire land for three hours. And whether an eyewitness or not, the death of Jesus was unavoidable in Jerusalem. Well, what does that mean for us today? In our confirmation class, Susanna Hoke explained it this way to the students. She said, God's grace is like this. It's like when your parent gives you a big hug and you're angry at them. Your parent's arms reach around you and you keep your arms stiff to your side and your back is arched. I won't have it. And your parent, they stand there holding you and they wait. Soon you warm up, you realize their pursuit, their warmth, their love. This is what God has done for us in Jesus at the cross. An act of love, an act of mercy, of forgiveness, while we weren't looking for it. We didn't want it. We didn't know we needed it. Our arms are down at our side. Jesus' death on the cross was that parent hugging us. Will we receive the hug? We asked our students, are you ready to hug back? If you are hearing and understanding the good news of Jesus for the very first time today, we will give you an opportunity to respond. Are you ready to hug back? Are you ready to receive this amazing gift of good grace. And if you're already following Jesus, have you allowed yourself to focus on him? Have you allowed him to fill you with, your, with his strength? Can you say, his power is made perfect in my weakness? Will you allow God's power to work through you as you share his love with your neighbor? Will you stop worrying about not having all the answers or all the arguments of the day? Will you allow Jesus Christ and him crucified to be your starting place? Well, I mentioned there was a third C, COVID. You wondered what happened with COVID. Well, during Lent, my family used up most of our free at-home testing kits. We had a family member, I won't name any names, um, who did test positive and was isolating for five days. And so the rest of us were constantly testing ourselves. We've become very mindful of every sniffle and every sneeze. Is that sore throat a cold or is it COVID? Well, on Monday of this week, my oldest son stayed home from school, not feeling well, and we did the at-home test kit, it came back negative, but I wasn't so sure. And so we drove and found a PCR test just to make sure. Well, the hard part with the PCR test is that you have to wait. And so all day Monday and into Tuesday, I was obsessively checking my phone for his status. Awaiting results kept flashing. Then I saw that they said his sample was sent to San Dimas, California. Ugh. Why so far away? I knew I should have gone to the UW testing site. Well, a positive result would greatly alter our week. His week, my week, today. I just wanted to know so that I knew what we were up against. And after a long day and a half, the answer finally came. None detected. 
a wave of relief filled our souls. I think you know this feeling. Friends, this is what the cross of, cross of Christ has done for us. We are all symptomatic. Sin is in all of our lives. We know it deep down. We dread the implications. And the cross of Jesus stands between us and God the Father so that when our holy God pulls up our sin record, he sees the words, none detected. Sweet relief. We can enjoy the presence of God. This is the message of the gospel. Jesus took our place on the cross. The sin in our life condemns us to death. We are the ones who deserve the cross. But Jesus took our place. And when we trust in Jesus, God chooses to see us as he sees Jesus, without sin or blemish. None detected. I don't want this moment to pass. And so I'd ask you, if you're in this room, to grab a Connect card in front of you and jot down a note of response. If you said yes to Jesus for the first time, there's a box on the back and you can check it. You can place this card in the offering boxes as you leave uh, today. And if you're online, you can see an opportunity in the chat to raise your hand or go to our website, upc.org slash Jesus. Or if you've known Jesus for a while and you're ready to place him in first position, write that down too. Wherever you are on your journey, we would love the opportunity to walk with you, to pray with you as you follow Jesus. And after our service today, there will be friends up front who can pray with you right now. Today might be your day to say yes. Today might be your day to say, I hug you back. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have spoken to us today through the model of the Apostle Paul who points us to the most significant moment in human history, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We cannot fully grasp your power, but we know that because Jesus died in our place, our sins are covered. They are no longer detected on our records. We thank you for pursuing us, each of us, and God, for those of us who are wanting to hug you back today, who are ready to say yes, we pray that you would confirm in our hearts your concrete love. Overwhelm us with the relief that comes from your forgiveness. And for those of us who know you but are ready to live with your strength as our engine, we pray that you would reveal to us the places we need to let go of our own strength to trust you more. May we too loosen our grip and embrace you back. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.